So there's a couple actions I want to take a quick look at. Uh, this is preliminary stuff, so not speculating, just talking about the facts and maybe what some of the things that we can glean from it is. So let's see what the setup is. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to take a quick look at two recent accidents this month in February 23. There's not enough data right now available to be definitive, but uh, I think what we can do or can know from what we know is very interesting, so we're going to take a look at that. And I think you'll agree. So let's follow the results of the investigation as it goes on and see what happens. First off is a uh, F-35 Bonanza. Uh, 123 one, two, Juliet Victor, uh, they went down shy of Gladewater, Texas, which is 07 Fox, uh, in early February 23. This was a cross country for the F 35. It left Hamilton, Alabama uh, at about 1108, apparently bound for Gladewater. And according to FlightAware, it was airborne for three hours and 10 minutes. I don't know what upgrades have been done to this airplane, uh, but the original factory engine was an E225 8. And it had a 40 gallon. It had 40 gallons worth of fuel on board, of which 34 is usable. Maybe it had an ox tank. We don't know. I would be surprised if the fuel burn was much less than 11 gallons an hour. So the airplane appeared to be on a VFR flight plan uh, and stayed at altitude for quite a while before descending down to Gladewater. So let's see the tape of the flight path right here, and then take a close-up look. Remember the speeds are ground speeds and the altitudes are ADSB reported. So the pilot elected to do two large circles uh, in opposite directions uh, to lose altitude for what appears to be a VFR pattern to 07 Fox for a left downwind runway 14. The descent rate throughout this uh, period is about five to 600 feet per minute, not successive, pretty much in the zone for passengers. And let's give the pilot the benefit of the doubt here and said that he had uh, he or she had FAA required VFR mins. The thing that I've experienced, and I've done a video on this subject, is that with less than six gallons of fuel in a Bonanza fuel tank, you stand a very real chance of unporting the fuel in a normal descent. I'm going to leave a link to that video uh, in the description below. So everyone survived this off airport landing. They reported there was four people on board, and that's really great. It's fantastic. Um, but what interests me is the amount of fuel left in the tanks. Say what you will about aeronautical decision-making in a long flight with four people on board the airplane. When you look at the ADS fly, ADSB flight path, flight path, it sure looks like a downwind base turn to me. And notice the base turn segment, it went dotted, which typically means a dropout of GPS data and extrapolation to the next ADSB hit. The final ADSB hit was at 700 feet and 99 knots, and then the airplane it executed a forced landing in the field short of the runway. Half mile, mile, mile and a half, various reports. At this point, it looks like a fuel importing situation to me. And there's about 10 to 15 seconds of fuel in the lines once an importing occurs, and then it'll take that or more for fuel get back to it once you've covered the porting in. And I've seen the, the unporting last for quite a while, well over a minute. I think the important thing is to take into consideration, the important thing to take in consideration here is fuel management. If you have to stop for gas, by all means do it. Plan to land on a tank with more than seven gallons in it. So the, I think what this accident highlights is how, just how do you do that? How do you run your fuel? Um, perhaps this is where I put my heretic hat on. Heretic hat on. I, I don't manage my fuel by using timers and other crutches to change tanks at some predetermined interval, like 30 minutes or something like that. I don't do that. From what I know about fuel tanks, at least for Bonanzas, is that if you have seven gallons or less in a fuel tank, you're running a real risk of uh, unporting. And for anything less than six gallons, you know, I consider that unusable fuel. In a descent, it's unusable. I can use it all in a cruise, but never in a descent. So my F-33C has two 40-gallon tanks, 37 gallons in each tank is usable, and I start uh, the engine with the fullest tank. If I've refueled, then I'll leave it on the selector on the tank I landed with, and then I'll taxi take off, climb out on that tank. Okay, and my plan is, is to cruise at altitude um, till I burn down to about 20, 24 gallons uh, on that tank that I started with. 
Then I'll switch over to the other side, and if I'm gonna be in a long cross country and fuel is an issue, then my plan is to burn all of that, all of that fuel in that tank before I go to the other one. Yes, I'm gonna exhaust all the fuel in that tank, all 37 gallons of it, or at least if I can. But the reality is my wife hates it when I do that, so I watch for the start of fuel flow and pressure fluctuations, okay? When it gets down to about three gallons left per tank, you can watch it. And then when you get down to about a gallon, you can definitely see fluctuations. At that point, I'll switch. There's going to be a little bit of fuel left, but I'm going to switch to the other tank. Generally, that happens, like I said, about one to two gallons left in the tank. When I switch to the tank that I started with, and now the, with the fuel flows that I use, means that I have about 1.6 hours of fuel left in the tank. I think of fuel overall as time not distance, it's all time. Your ground speed's gonna vary well, and you know, that's outside your control, you can't do anything about it. But how much time you stay in the air is something that you control. So my land now limit, my minimum fuel, if you will, uh, that I use is one hour of fuel. Yeah, it works out to be about 15-ish gallons uh, to make that happen. If I'm short of my destination, well, then I land and refuel. I've been watching the winds and my ground speed and my fuel burn, so I've already been making plans to divert for quite a while leading up to this situation, so I go ahead and do it. It makes the decision quite simple, and I, you know, frankly, I've done it a lot. Uh, it's kind of common to how I fly the airplane. I'm watching the fuel, and if I can't make it land within an hour, I land and refuel. So in my above scenario means that I switch to the tank that I use for takeoff. I've got less than 30 minutes before I land and refuel. It just doesn't matter to me if it's five minutes or 20 minutes, I'm shy of that destination. You know, if I hit that point, I'm gonna land. I bought the e-ticket and I'm gonna stop. I do this all the time. Okay, it's nothing but a thing. Just get, it is what it is, just get used to it. You know, you can't control the air, ground speed. So I have run out of gas. That's a story for another time. I'm not gonna talk about it. And I never, ever, ever wanna do that again. So I land with an hour's worth of fuel. Anyway, that's what I do. And I wanna see what happens with this F-35. So stay tuned, I'm gonna keep watching on it. The second accident uh, did not work out so well. The funny thing is, is that uh, this particular, this same airplane, this particular airplane, had a forced landing about a year and a half ago. And then it was a club airplane then and still in the same club. And that first accident looked suspiciously like fuel exhaustion. Uh, and on 16 January 2023, 8266 Delta, a PA32 Turbo Saratoga, crashed northwest of Oklahoma City. It belonged to a flying club in Bethany, Oklahoma, and apparently this was the first flight after an annual inspection, during which a new autopilot was installed during the annual. The reports, reports also say that this, is, this particular flight, first flight, was an instructional flight focused on the new autopilot. There was a pilot and CFI on board the airplane. So let's take a look at the tape of the ADSB record, okay? It looks like it's maneuvering flight and then generally starts a, a wide right-hand turn uh, through north to the east. Looking at the descent rate, I'm not really sure it's on autopilot. It just doesn't look like it. It's up and down, up and down. So I don't know um, what autopilot was installed in the airplane, but the latest and greatest from Garmin is pretty rock steady. I've got a GFC 500 and it's rock steady. So it may be an s -tech. <laughs> who knows? What happens right, uh, right here at the end are some large variation in vertical velocity. I'm sure the action, the action is related to that. That's before the descent. They, had some pitch fugoid thing going. The ground speeds don't vary much throughout the accident, not really, and the heading seems to stay pretty much easterly as well, but the descent rates go up exponentially. The last ADSB hit showed a descent rate of about 7,300 feet per minute. There are some discrepancies here in that record. If the airplane had stalled and spun, then I would actually expect to see slower ground speeds and more GPS dropouts but the descent rates are consistent with a stall spin. 7,300 feet per minute, somewhere around six to seven-ish, that's a stall spin. Then I read a report on the Aviation Safety Network of the accident uh, where somebody did a, described the impact site itself. So far there are no pictures to go by, so I can't examine post-impact damage of the actual aircraft. But the, the impact was described as near vertical 
with the, the prop left in the impact crater with a descent rate starting at about 1,000 feet per minute and to the final one at about 7,300 feet per minute. I would really expect that an airplane to have exceeded its V&E and come apart in a vertical dive, honestly. As to, and I would see in a vertical dive the, the uh, ground speed to fall off quite a bit too, and it didn't. Uh, so, a little confusing. The description of the crash site doesn't support that particularly, but it's, the whole thing's, in my opinion, a bit vague about where the, the uh, fuselage is. It's 100 feet away. That's a big disconnect, uh, and it's north of the initial impact point, but the last headings let you think that it was an easterly direction. How does that happen? means that the, the deep, typically the deep debris vector from the crash is going to follow the flight path. And even near vertical, it's going to be along the flight path, maybe and shortened. But from the description here, there has to be some kind of rotation involved on the impact to square that with the ADSB derived direction. Okay, this picture is purported to be from a witness at the, uh, to the accident. Okay, there is some variation of the flight path. You can see here and that's reasons, un reasons unknown. The witness reported black smoke could be seen followed by the airplane apparently rolling over and then impacting the ground with, a, with an explosion. It doesn't, according to the smoke, it doesn't look like a near vertical descent. It doesn't talk about the end game. Smoke it does indicate a fire of some sort. I expect fuel, be, I suspect fuel because fuel pretty much burns black. It doesn't completely burn. Oil tends to burn white as does electrical fire. And uh, this is a lot of smoke. That's a lot of smoke. So I'm expecting something fuel related. Uh, we'll see what happens. It's still too early to pull lessons learned from this accident. What we, what we really know is, is that the pilots lost control of the airplane. We don't know the sequence or what precipitated that accident. Hopefully the NTSB prelim report will discover more detail. From that we can make a more detailed analysis, okay? I'm sure there are a lot of things out here for folks to speculate, speculate on. I'm not going to be one of them. I want to know a little bit more about the detail before we can talk about it. But, because there's just not enough facts here to reconcile the problems that we know of. Okay? Now, I think you can see why jumping to conclusions at this point in an accident is not really productive. Yeah, okay, we've got to wait a little while. You need to know the facts to generate a working theory. And that theory must conform to the facts, okay? So speculating about stuff that you have no idea of, whether it's a fact or not, is kind of a waste of time. That's my nickel. So I do have a couple of observations, though, uh, and that one of the biggest ones is when an airplane comes out of annual, when I do an, air, an annual, et cetera, I do a test flight all by itself, no other objective for the flight. It's going up to test to make sure the airplane's good to go and then I'll land and fix it if it's not. I'm not keen on the idea of a first flight out of major maintenance being an instructional flight, okay, especially with the new autopilot and you ring it out and it has not correct or something like that. The thing I'm teaching new folks to fly a particular airplane is that they, that they knew all the ways to disconnect the autopilot. You know, I like autopilots, but I don't trust them. They're good for specific things and I'm careful about putting all my life, putting my life into the hands of an autopilot. You got to know how to shut it off. In days of old, uh, years ago, King Autopilots had a big problem with not being able to, to uh, uh, run away trim and then having trouble being able to disconnect it. So it's always a good idea to know exactly how to do that. Uh, so those two, two big learning items there. So stand by. We're going to keep following this. Uh, and we'll talk more about it when the prelim comes out if there's more accident uh, information, more facts that we can work on. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.